perspectives on innovative and creative ideas in the legal industry. I'm Marlene Gabauer. And I'm Greg Lambert. So we are welcoming back our very first Mm -hmm. podcast guest from over six years ago, Zena Applebaum. Uh, Zena is now the Senior Vice President Market Development at Harbor. So, Zena, we are very, very happy to get you back on the show. Sorry it took us so long to get I you back. I can't believe it's been six years. <laughs> well, you know, lots of lots of other great guests were here, so good. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, so, we are glad to have you back. So, I know that you've only recently moved over to Harbor, but I'm going to ask you the hard question. So, how's it going so far? Honestly, so far, it's been great. A little bit overwhelming. Like, there's a lot coming at me from all different areas of the business, but everybody's super excited, super engaged, mm-hmm. excited to have me here. And I really feel like I can add value, which is great. Like you want to switch jobs knowing that you have a purpose and that you can contribute meaningfully. And I'm already starting to feel that. So, so far, so good. Awesome. Cool. So you're coming to Harbor from Thomson Reuters. And so reflecting on your time at Thomson Reuters, what were some of the most significant challenges you faced when driving the go-to-market strategy for SaaS products, particularly for Westlaw? I mean, there's been a lot of changes with Westlaw in the last few years. Yeah, so Westlaw is an interesting one, right? Like it is the market leader in legal research and what it does. And I think the biggest challenge, and this is going to come as no surprise to you or any of your listeners who have probably are sick of what I'm about to say, but I think, you know, Gen AI early 23, I think bringing Gen AI to products that previously wasn't on the radar was a, was a challenge, right? And helping people understand what Gen AI can or can't do, what the risks are, how quickly it's going to change or impact their processes or not, quite frankly, and then balancing possibilities with the reality and the faith. So I think that was the expectations. Yeah. And helping them, you know, you want to you want to build a market when you work for one of these organizations. But at the same time, you want to be realistic in what you can deliver and what the products are actually capable of doing. Finding that balance when customers are also really asking for something and really want it to be the panacea of legal research. At the end of the day, legal research is hard and it's going to continue to be hard. But there are things we can do to make it easier. So it was just really educating the market on what. Gen AI can or can't do was really, I think, one of the most challenging things of, I'd say, the last 18 months and continues to be a challenge going forward. I just think it's interesting that so many, like research is the focus, like Gen AI, like everybody wants to have that as the answer to research. And as you said, like research is one of the hardest problems to figure out, but that's immediately what everybody wants to go to. Because it's time consuming and it sucks. And if there's a way to make it easier and better... You know, of course, everybody wants that, but it's also the special sauce, right? And so you don't want to necessarily take that away from litigators either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I, I imagine there was pressure to get the word out. So how were you able to work with your internal team to make sure that what you were pushing out for the message was meeting what was actually going on? I mean, do you have to have a lot of conversations with Oh, internal? yeah. Like, We spent a lot of time. So my team working with the Westlaw team, the practical law team, the co-counsel team as well, we would spend a ton of time together because you don't want to put out more in the market over promise and under deliver. That's the last thing you want to do, especially when you're the incumbent. And to their credit, the product owners at Thomson Reuters really wanted to take their time and get it as right as they possibly could, rather than jumping the gun and getting to market with something that was substandard. They hold themselves to a really high account and they didn't want to buy into the hype before they were ready. So yeah, we spent a lot of time with them and we would never put anything forward that didn't meet customer expectations. The funny part is, of course, many of the people who work on Westlaw are former attorneys or non-practicing attorneys. So they're just as risk averse um, as actual practicing attorneys and they want to make sure that whatever they put in market actually can deliver on what they say it does. Well, we've known you a long time. And actually, when we first met, which was, gosh, I, I won't say what year it was. <laughs> but, but luckily, I, I, you know, you were 12 and I was I don't know, 14 <laughs> yeah. and, in New Orleans. And I know that doesn't make sense. But, <laughs> but you, it's true. 
I mean, you kind of broke through in into this market as an expert in, in competitive intelligence and market insights. And so how, sticking with the Thomson Reuters experience, when you moved from Bennett Jones, the law firm in Toronto, to TR, how were you able to le- leverage the skills that you were kind of, I don't know, uh, in, not inventing or moving over into the legal industry? Because you know, competitive intelligence, well known in the business market, but not that necessarily well known at the time in the legal. So, what? How were you able to take the skills that you had and enhance the product marketing there and sales uh, enablement there at Thomson Reuters? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and you know, the obvious, the, the answer that I think most people think I'm going to say is, oh, you know, I monitor what Lexus did, and that's part of it. But the reality is competitive intelligence is so much bigger than just what are your competitors doing. It's looking at things like market dynamics. When I teach competitive intelligence, the two things I I tell people to look for, or the two things that good competitive intelligence does is it plans for the future and it avoids surprises. So what can Thomson Reuters do at the product level, at the market level, at the macroeconomic level as a public company? What are the things it can do to not just understand their customers and the market dynamics, but the value proposition of their products, the messaging of their products, such that they avoid surprises and plan for the future? And that's really where something like generative AI comes in, right? It's like, it's not going to change the world today, but looking 5, 10, 15 years out, where are we going to be and how do we plan to get there? How do we bring our clients along with us to get there? So Using that sort of competitive intelligence framework, we would apply a lot of those learnings to our products, but also to the way in which we enable our sales teams, the conversations I would have with sales teams about what triggers to listen for with customers. So when customers are talking about X, they're talking about data modernization. Why are they talking about that? And what does that lead you to? And what products that you, what products do you have or services you can provide that align to some of their trigger words? So it's really those two things, I think, planning for the future and avoiding surprises. So are you telling them to talk less and listen more? I was going to say it's it's sentiment analysis. (laughs) Active listening, man. It's important. So I'm going to shift the conversation over to Harbor. So what motivated you to make that transition from Thomson Reuters to Harbor? You were obviously doing a lot of really cool things at TR. And Also, what excites you most about your new role as Senior Vice President of Market Development? I will say that I ran to an opportunity, not away from one. So I I did make sure when I was having conversations with Harbor, they really took the time to reflect that uh, I was doing cool stuff at Thomson Reuters and I was really deeply embedded in a fantastic team. There is no better product team out there to work with than the Westlaw team and the practical law teams the checkpoint teams that I was working with at Thomson Reuters, they really are the experts in their domain. And so I had to make sure that I was running towards an opportunity that was going to help me grow as an individual and particularly was going to help me shift my focus away from products more towards my legal domain expertise and more towards doing the things that energize me, which is enabling a smaller sales team, being a part of a smaller company. I did feel a little bit occasionally like I would get lost at Thomson Reuters. It's 26,000 people as opposed to Harbor, which is hovering around 800, more in line with something like Bennett Jones when I was there. So what excites me is the ability to actually have impact, the ability to actually provide services on a more holistic scale across the entire workflow. So we've talked about legal research a lot, but when you look at a company like Harbor and what they're doing, The services they provide really start from strategy and transformation right through to sort of application managed services or optimization of services. So really the ability to play in the legal domain across the entire workflow is what excites me. And yeah, that's what motivated me to make the change. I relished my time at TR. It was great. I learned a ton. I'm grateful for the seven years I had there, but uh, it's just time to make a change. So, you know, given your new responsibilities there at Harbor, kind of what what was the motivator for Harbor to bring you on that they wanted you to kind of take the reins of right away? And then the second part of that question, I'll ask it now, is 
once you've got that knocked out, what, what are kind of your long, long range strategies or ideas that you think you can bring to Harbor? So it's been just about four weeks, so I'm not sure I've hit anything yet. Um, just figured out how to well, spell Harbor. Plan in place. It's been a month. Well, I have a 30, 60, 90 in, in place. I'm almost <laughs> at the 30 day mark. I've learned to spell Harbor without a U. Yeah. So that, that was the first That's important. Very thing. important. Yes. No, in all seriousness, though, I think the first thing they wanted me to do was to help them define what that full suite value proposition is and what that portfolio story looks like. Given the history of Harbor and it's coming up on its one year anniversary as a company, Harbor is one. And what does that mean to the market? What does that mean internally and externally? And how do we make sure that that manifests in the service delivery as well? So that's, I think, my first priority. And then there's some other areas of interest, not surprisingly. What do we do with our competitive intelligence offering and how do we scale that to offer our clients service in a way that maybe they haven't seen before? Longer now, term? Well, actually, before you jump into that, let, let me ask you this. You mentioned that Harbor is coming up on the, the one year kind of rebranding, re, reinventing itself as one company. And I, I fell into this trap when I was talking with Chris Martin in Chicago is I was still thinking HBR and the pieces that they've acquired over time. And I was like, well, what are you doing with this and this and this and this? And, and you could tell he was a little confused. He's like, well, it's all one now. It's not, they're not seen as these individual pieces anymore. It's all one. So did you... Is it kind of nice that you're coming in now that they're all one, or are you still kind of remembering it as it was and trying to uh, adjust to how it is now? They've come a really long way in a year or just under a year. I remember listening to Kay Sycamore at ILTA last year. I remember listening to her at their sort of Harbor coming out party, talking about what Harbor means, and they've come a really long way. So there is still conversation about the heritage brands and sometimes people will understand harbor only in the context of one of the heritage brands but i think we've moved beyond that being the only explanation for harbor and i do think harbor has really taken hold and people really are beginning to see the company as that company all right well now i'll let you answer what are some of the, the yeah. long range well and i think it, it ties in in terms of my long-term goals my long-term goals are really to help the industry see Harbor as their one advisor. The way you would think of a KPMG or a Del Deloitte or a McKinsey, we really want people to think of Harbor as the one place you go to help with whatever needs your legal department or your law firm has in terms of strategy, transformation, management consulting, as well as some of the other areas that we offer. So that that's the long-term goal. So I'm curious, it's like, you know, you were talking about AI earlier and having a, a big impact on uh, the legal landscape. So is that part of what you see, you know, a role that Harbor might be playing in that evolution? Yeah. I mean, the one really nice thing about Harbor is that we are technology agnostic. So if a firm decides to go with Elite um, for their financial systems or they are an adherent shop, whatever they are, we can plug and play and we can help them understand how to get the most out of whatever technology they're using, including the AI enhanced versions of those products. And more importantly, we can help firms who want to take advantage of generative AI or any AI, quite frankly, if they want to take advantage of AI, if they want to take advantage of cloud and people are moving at various rates to the cloud. That was very polite. Um, and I, I'm, you know, you've, you've heard many, you've had many guests on talking about cloud migrations and whether you should be cloud for years, forward or not. For years. <laughs> I think the reality is, and thank you to Microsoft at 365, like we're going to get there. Everybody's going to get there. But getting there is still scary and difficult. And a, a company like Harbor can help you get there, you know, with things like understanding your data strategy, helping you modernize your data strategy or modernizing your tech stack optimizing other services in your workflow to get you ready to take advantage of these things and be future ready as well, both as a service offering, but also so that the firms can be future ready for their clients and in-house departments can be more effective for the business that they serve. So I think 
the idea about AI, it is having a fundamental impact on the legal industry. I think it's having a fundamental impact on every industry. Legal is just one of them. And when you think about large language models and you think about generative AI, I, I would say this at workshops, like, what is the second L in large language models? And people would stare at me like I had two heads. But the L is actually about language, right? And the legal industry is predicated on language. It's like putting language together for the benefit of your client, whether it's to mitigate risk or from a contract perspective for litigation planning. So I think that's why the legal industry feels like it's interacting differently with large language models than maybe some other industries. It has a more material impact on the work that lawyers do or should do. But the role that Harbor plays in helping you understand how you could take advantage of not just AI, but how you can take advantage of all of the technological impact in the market. And it's moving really quickly. We can meet clients where they are in their evolution and help them get where they want to go as well. Well, I want to follow up just briefly on that because we talked a lot about this being one of the first true technologies that really makes a big impact on language. And that was the one thing that kind of held a lot of the other advancements in technology back in the legal industry because legal is like, well, we're different. We're much more around the wording, you know, in the nuance. And then all of a sudden we have a tool that everyone thought would immediately kind of change the entire world. And now we're coming up on, you know, a year and a half, almost two years after the first LLMs went publicly available. And we haven't moved all that far for most law firms. And in fact, our mutual friend, Ryan McLeod, is basically saying, you know, the magic that was supposed to take over the industry just really hasn't happened yet. So what are you thinking that as we're readjusting to this new expectation of what the large language models and AI can do, where do you think Harbor it will position itself in advising law firms, companies to go forward? Yeah, I think that the position that I'm seeing so far is we'll really meet you where you are. Like we want to get you to the place where you're ready to take advantage of the technology and of the tools at a pace and a rate that makes sense for you, recognizing that some may need a bit more of a push than others as well. Um, and that's what our strategy and transformation team can help them understand is how far behind they might be or they could be and how they can leapfrog forward should they choose to. But I think ultimately, whatever plan or strategy you have, we can help you achieve whatever your goals are for your firm, whether it's better customer service, better client service, or optimizing your data in a way to take advantage of things like Fabric from Microsoft, uh, which is just out of beta, or some of the other products that are out there that can really help drive efficiency in a firm. We can help you get there or in a legal department. Well, Zena, we're at the moment where we have the crystal ball question, and we didn't have this question when yeah, you Yeah, we never had time, a crystal so. ball question for Zena. That was a new addition in the uh, last six years. Yes, yes. So we've had, we have different music, we have different questions, we have different platform we record different on. Platform. Or, Everything's different. Yeah. It, it, it's but like we're all not the even same. the same. Yeah, That's exactly. True. Exactly. We, we are exactly the same. So we have the crystal ball question that we ask, and that is, what change or challenge do you think that the legal industry is going to have to address in the next two to five years? Um, I think that in-house departments are becoming far more sophisticated than they ever have been. The technology tools and the incentive to use them is greater for in-house departments than it was previously. I think as a result, the war on talent is continuing to increase for law firms. As AI continues to drive efficiency, and, and we are seeing it in incremental steps. It's not, it didn't happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. But I do think we've come, even in the last 18 months, the number of firms that are investing in AI that are talking about AI, the number of chief AI officers that have been named, as AI continues to drive discussion and efficiency in the market, and technology continues to move faster, I think that demand will continue to increase for lawyers and for the work that they do. Volume will continue to rise as resources continue to shift and people want different things out of their legal careers. 
And that's where I think you're going to see a lot of change in the next five years in the industry. Excellent. Well, Zena Applebaum, the Senior Vice President of Market Development at Harbor, without a U, thanks for returning to the show. Thanks let's for not, having me. Let's not take six years next time. Let's not wait six years. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. Let's do it again soon. Yeah, thank you, Zena. And of course, thanks to all of you, our listeners, for taking the time to listen to the Geek and Review podcast. If you enjoy the show, share it with a colleague. We'd love to hear from you, so reach out to us on LinkedIn. Zena, we'll put uh, links in the show notes, but what's the best way for people to find out more about Harbor or to reach out to you with more questions if they have them? Harborglobal.com or reach out to me personally at zena.applebaum at harborglobal.com or, of course, at zapplecii on that platform formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Zena. And as always, the music you hear is from Jerry David DeSica. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. All right. See you guys later. Okay. Bye-bye.